morning and welcome everyone. This is Pete Meyer. I'm the technical editor for Motor Age Magazine. Welcome to tonight's webinar on the pros and cons of rebuilding a CVT. Uh, before I introduce our presenter, a few little uh, homework items here. Number one, if you have any questions during the event, please enter them in the Q&A column there. We will take care of those at the end of the presentation. Secondly, I want to give a, a big welcome to not only our U.S. registrants, but everyone who is attending from outside the U.S. We have quite a few folks, a uh, big representation from the folks down under in Australia, uh, and then our friends to the north up in Canada, big, uh, big pile of guys from there, and uh, really from just about every corner of the globe. Uh, just to, to show you just how uh, respected our presenter tonight is, uh, Wayne, Wayne Colonna. Wayne is the president of ATSG. He is also the publisher of our uh, Powertrain Pro product, and this is their very first webinar. Wayne, good evening. How are you? I'm doing well, sir. Thank you. How are you? Great, great. Well, I know you got an awful lot of great information on this topic, so I'm not going to waste any more time. Wayne, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you, Pete, and I, too, would like to thank and welcome all of you who are out there listening tonight, and uh, I would also like to thank Transstar and TransTech, who are our sponsors for this evening's presentation. And like Pete said, we're going to touch on the pros and cons of rebuilding a CVT transmission. Now, the majority of tonight's presentation is directed toward the mainstream shops, and we're going to provide tips on a diagnostic approach to assist in determining if the shop can rebuild that CVT profitably or if the transmission will need to be replaced. Now, part of this process is to be aware of some of the common failures that have occurred through the years, which this presentation will cover, at least some of them. We can't do them all. We don't have the time but as well as some of the mistakes made by others so that you can avoid making those same mistakes yourself for those of you who for the first time would decide to tackle one of these transmissions. Now, talking about the pros and cons of rebuilding a CVT, there are two very strong pros to rebuilding CVTs. The first being is that there are a good many of them on the road right now here in North America, uh, and with manufacturers announcing increased use of these CVTs in years to come. And the second strong pro in favor of rebuilding these transmissions is that they are really not too difficult to work on. Uh, they are a different type of transmission, so if you've not worked on one yet, there will be a learning curve involved. But with the many manufacturers announcing the increased use of these transmissions, it will be hard to ignore them, especially since not all of them experience catastrophic failures. Even today, Honda, Nissan, Audi, Dodge, and Jeep have a good many of their units showing up in the shops right now in need of repair. And of course, GM's discontinued VT2025 and Ford CFT30 are no slouches either. So there is ample opportunity to put your toe in the water and get familiar with CVT transmissions. Now admittedly, there are legitimate reasons why some may not want to tackle a CVT. A lack of technical information may be one the cost of purchasing any special tools required to do the rebuild, as well as parts availability and pricing, are without question justifiable reasons to dismiss doing a CVT rebuild. No doubt they can be showstoppers. But these reasons do not always apply to each and every failed CVT that may show up into your shop. Now, when I handle, <coughs> excuse me, when I handle a tech call on ATSG's hotline support, I try to help the shop sort this out. And I have a simple approach, um, several points to this simple approach, which I, I'd like to share with you tonight. And the beginning of this simple approach is that, first of all, being familiar with CVTs out on the road, I consider the CVTs and Hondas to be the most rebuild friendly, and, and next in line would be Audi, 
vehicles, while BMW minis I consider to be the most unfriendly. And, and I mean that in terms of I can't tell you how many guys have rebuilt these transmissions and they're just not working right after they're done rebuilding them. Just a real challenge on, on those minis. Uh, but this is my spectrum and I place all the other CVTs within this range. However, the order in which I place these CVTs in this spectrum will vary depending upon the type of failure being experienced, parts availability and pricing, programming capabilities, and the level of tech actually working on the transmission. Now, that is just the beginning of my simple approach, and I, I need to back up because there's another addition to this simple approach, but I want to back up and, and begin by saying, as with any new job that comes into the shop, there is an initial necessary conversation with the owner-driver of the vehicle to gather information followed up by a road test and scanning for codes. But after the initial customer complaint confirmation, it may be necessary to have a secondary deeper diagnostic stage in order to properly assess the vehicle's condition and the work required to make the total repair. And some shops may charge for this diagnostic time as it may require doing pressure checks pan inspection, researching any and all associated bulletins, and I need to bring that up because when it comes to approaching CVTs, it may be necessary that even after a road test and scanning codes, asking some questions, uh, it may be necessary to do some pressure testing, dropping the pan, pulling the valve body, and getting a good visual on the drive, uh, drive pulley assembly, the belts. Um, and so having said that, Continuing with this simple approach, um, we've got to continue to keep this in your mind. We want to have an idea of the difficulty of the type of transmission, Honda being the most friendly, then getting the idea that it may be necessary to do some pressure testing, may be necessary to pull the pan and valve body. But the other aspect to this is I put CVTs into two categories, one with a torque converter and one without a torque converter. This is critical because CVTs th that use a torque converter allows the vehicle to come to a stop and remain in gear like any conventional automatic transmission using a torque converter. However, CVTs that do not use a torque converter has to release the driving clutch when it comes to a stop to prevent engine stall, then creep the clutches back on to launch the vehicle. So these clutches are susceptible to wear and damage as opposed to the ones that use torque converters. Now, a CVT with or without a torque converter starts the identification process of knowing the differences in the operating systems among each of the CVT transmissions on the road as they're not all the same, and knowing these differences lends towards a more precise diagnosis regarding delayed engagements, harsh engagements, slip concerns, and or a no movement complaint. And, <clears throat> you know, since it is a CVT, as a result of these different complaints of engagement, many think the worst and come immediately concerned about the pulley system, and rightfully so, but this is also a reason why we may need to do pressure checking, and we want to use the vehicle as a transmission dyno to check pulley and pressures, pulley pressures and clutch pressures if need be. Now, if we're going to check pulley pressure, it will require having the ability to check pressures beyond 500 PSI. And for this type of testing, I would highly recommend the use of transducers instead of a typical pressure gauge. It's not a good day when you've got 1,000 pounds in your gauge and it blows off your hose. So I really recommend um, having transducers when checking uh, a pulley pressure. Now, to check these pressures, the drive and driven pulley pressures, um, really gives us some useful information in the sealing capabilities of those pulleys, as well as the possible condition of the push belt or chain. Now, 
if there are no pressure taps, and there are some of these CVTs that have no pressure taps, besides level and smell, I suggest as my next step to check the condition of the fluid in terms of metal contamination. Most CVTs have a pan that can be dropped for a visual inspection, which can easily reveal uh, abnormal metal deposits. And by pulling the valve body, it will allow a visual of the push belt and pulley sheath face so you can actually do a physical inspection of the internal components besides just looking at the metal. Now, the idea is that by this time, you've already driven the vehicle. You've already pulled codes. So you know if you have electrical concerns, transmission concerns or both, and possible converter issues if so equipped. And by pressure testing and doing a pan inspection along with a visual look at the pulleys and belt, by this time you should have a good sense of what you're up against with not having a great deal of time and labor invested in making this assessment. But now, to further enhance this process, it helps to know the unique function of the transmission that you are evaluating and its common failures. And to add this diagnostic perspective to enhance the assessment stage is our next step. So let's start with CVTs that do not use torque converters. In these cases, a dual mass flywheel or a torsional damper plate is used between the engine and transmission. When these fail, it can cause vibrations, metallic noises, clicky noises, chatter sensations. So we can't rule these out of the diagnostic process. And, and I've seen these damper plates uh, run between two and $400. So that has to be part of the evaluation process. But now, let's take a look at our first CVT for this evening, the, the Honda CVT, which once again, in my personal opinion, is one of the friendliest CVTs to work on and a great one to learn with if you're going to start working on these. And I say that this is a friendly unit because, well, number one, it has all the pressure taps that you need. Um, it has all the pulley pressures. It has clutch pressure. Um, you can drop the pan and do a visual inspection. Um, so this unit is fitted with all the pressure taps needed to check all these pressures, which is definitely helpful in performing preliminary diagnosis. And with the pan being able to be removed and doing a visual inspection, and that through pressure testing and pan ins inspection for excessive metal contaminants, a tech can begin to gather enough information to develop a good assessment of the problem at hand. Another reason why this is such a friendly unit is there's much information available for this unit. There's many parts available for this unit. Some of them are reasonably priced. Uh, a very easy unit to rebuild. Um, and, and, and to begin to further enhance our understanding of Honda's unique operating system, it will go a long way in really pinpointing diagnostics just on a road test. See, this transmission, which is very unique to itself, it has a forward clutch a reverse clutch, and a start clutch. Like I said, it's an operating system unique to itself. There's no other CVT out on the road like it. Because when the forward clutch is applied, in other words, when forward is selected or reverse is selected, the, the, the related clutch applies and it remains applied at all times. And this keeps the pulley system, otherwise known as a variator, in constant rotation. The start clutch, however, is cleverly positioned between the variator assembly and the differential. It is this clutch that remains off until the vehicle needs to move. It is then crept on for a smooth apply, completing the power flow to the differential. So this clutch is constantly pulsed on and off, and it makes it very susceptible to failure, and fail it does. Start clutch failure is the most common failure with this transmission. But by knowing this unique operating system, it provides a more focused diagnosis for this particular CVT. If the vehicle only slips in forward, it works great in reverse. This suggests that the forward clutch has an issue 
and the variator and the star clutch are working. However, if it slips in all ranges, both forward and reverse, this suggests that the star clutch or the variator is an issue. Now, by understanding this unique operating system, it aids in determining what specific pressure testing you may need to do. If it slips in all ranges, both the start clutch and pulley pressures will need to be checked to determine which of these components has failed. Now, another, another friendly aspect to working on Honda CVTs is that when you do have to replace the start clutch, there is various start clutch relearn procedures that need to be done, and it's based on year and make of vehicle, and it's very simple to do. Now, <clears throat> using this Honda CVT as our first example, in a relatively short order of time, just by almost even a road test, you can have a reasonable assessment as to what type of repairs may be involved. And, and you may be able to then determine if you need to check this pressure, um, or you may need to want to just drop the pan, pull the valve body, and take a look inside. Now, we're going to compare some numbers here in just a second. Um, one of the, one of the um, um, self-inflicted injuries that happened with this particular CVT that I kind of just briefly want to mention is hooking up the solenoids that are on the valve body. When you take this harness off, it's easy when you put the harness back on to cross-connect solenoids. So I would highly recommend uh, perhaps maybe even taking a, a digital photo like this one so that you don't make that mistake. But now, <clears throat> let's take a look, and, and by the way, that's a lot of lost, wasted time, because especially if you've done this for the first time, you might be thinking you did something wrong inside the transmission, so it's really good to be aware that these are easily done, this cross-connect scenario. Anyway, looking at some numbers, um, if we take a look at, say, a brand new transmission, you know, it's looking at around maybe $3,400 for a brand new transmission, maybe more. Um, if you wanted to rebuild the transmission, um, we got 14 hours of labor applied to, um, to that kind of job. In the middle of this, uh, of this printout, which I got off of all data, um, you could see that r and r it, they give you about 6.7 hours. Now, going for parts and looking, again, at what makes Honda so friendly is that you can do this. You can install. You can do some price shopping, uh, and um, you can get specific and get right into some transmission information. And we're going to take a look at a worst-case scenario with the intermediate plate, and we're also going to take a look at the start clutch assembly because start clutch assembly is the most common failure, and it does sell it as an assembly. The intermediate plate is talking about both the drive and driven pulleys mounted on the intermediate plate between the two case halves. That's your worst case scenario, is to have to go for a whole pulley assembly, variator assembly. Now, <clears throat> when we look at that intermediate plate, we can see that that is gonna run near close to $2,000. Now, the, the brand new transmission was about $3,300, $3,400, so we're halfway there with just doing this intermediate plate. Now, the start clutch assembly, runs in at around $370. Um, if you're looking for a filter, it's around uh, $45 for a filter. Um, then we've got fluid. We're in at around 40 bucks for fluid. So when you start throwing some of these numbers together and understanding the type of uh, failures that you have with just a road test and maybe a pan drop and some pressure testing, um, a new transmission can run as high as $3,500, intermediate plate 2000 That's your worst-case scenario. However, a star clutch assembly is 370 bucks. Again, a filter is around $45. A kit might range between 125 and 250 Fluid is in around $40. Now, labor, you have 14 hours to overhaul it, 6.7 to R&R it, so you're looking at 21 hours, an average of $100 an hour labor rate. I know in California we could be as high as 150 Some smaller towns I've seen. 85, 95, so just 100 bucks. Just, the idea is you can get an idea by just a simple road test and, and, and some scanning and, and, and a little bit of uh, maybe dropping a pan and looking at the valve body uh, uh, with the valve body removed, the, the belts, pressure testing. Within 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, you can have a good assessment as to where you are with this particular transmission. 
And, and moving along now with that same principle of mind, in other words, what we have to have in our mind is, number one, uh, really understand the unique operating system of the particular CVT that you're driving in. As we learned with the Honda, it's the only one that has a start clutch, okay? Um, and so knowing how that system works, you can begin to understand if it's slipping in all ranges, you know you got a problem with that start clutch or the variator. If it's just slipping in reverse, you know it could be just a reverse clutch, forward, just a forward clutch, and so on. Um, uh, and so having that in mind, um, the 01J uh, CVT that's in Audi vehicles, the only thing that is the same about the um, Honda is that it doesn't have a torque converter, and it, too, has a dual-mass flywheel uh, a, a torsion damper plate type. So, again, we've got to keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> but now that's just about where the, um, uh, com the similarities between a Honda and an Audi ends right there is with the damper plate. Um, this particular transmission does not have a start clutch. It only has a forward and reverse clutch, which obviously if you're going forward, when you come to a stop, the forward clutch has got to come off. When you start, it's got to be crept on. Same thing with reverse. Um, another thing that's totally different is uh, this particular transmission does not have a pan that can be dropped, so we can't do any visual inspection. Um, it does not have any pressure taps, and the computer is mounted inside the transmission. So it has very much significant differences when compared to a, uh, a Honda a CVT. Um, and um, with having such limited um, diagnostics available to you, um, this to help, overcome, well, to help overcome such limited diagnostics and visual inspections, we need to rely on several things. We need to rely on the use of all technical resources, the use of an appropriate scan tool, and, and then a good understanding of this transmission's operating system and common failures. Being mindful of these points while on a road test, you can have a component elimination thought process which can get pretty close to the type of failure this transmission may have and the type of damage that may be the result of that failure. For example, with both the forward and reverse clutch having to be released when at a stop and pulsed back on to launch the vehicle, it's obvious that the forward clutch system is the most overly active clutch system in the unit and is most susceptible to failure, and fail it does. Um, the forward clutch circuit um, begins with this feed pipe in the back of the case where it mounts up against the valve body. And this pipe goes into the entrainment pump, and the entrainment pump has a pipe that goes into the forward clutch drum assembly. And so now you have uh, the seal on the back of that valve body, um, you have pipes that are involved, you have an entrainment pump that's involved, you have the, um, the actual uh, forward clutch piston uh, seals. So there are many places and areas for a leak to occur in that forward clutch circuit besides the fact that it is so overly worked coming to a stop and releasing the clutch and reapplying that clutch. So it is extremely susceptible to damage. And these are the types of failures that you will see with this particular CVT. Now, if only reverse had issues, which is a very rare scenario, then the reverse clutch system would be suspect. So if we just have forward clutch problems or forward movement problems and reverse is okay, that's letting us know that the variator assembly is fine. If it's just reverse, then we know that we have just a reverse problem and the variator is okay. But now, if it slips in all ranges with the 01J, this becomes a little bit more of a concern because now this could mean that there's something wrong with the filter. So the question you would have to ask yourself is, why? What's loading it up? So we might have a big job here. Um, there could be a problem with the pump or the valve body assembly, particularly the pressurizing valve in the valve body, or we do actually have a variator assembly problem. 
and uh, and these would be considered uh, a major scenario here. And you know, depending on parts availability and pricing, this uh, this type of damage here might require the use of uh, of another transmission. Um, now. There's another scenario that occurs frequently with the O1J that we want to be clear on, and that is a sudden no-move condition. And there's three things that usually cause a sudden no-move condition, a couple of them fairly catastrophic or fairly uh, um, um, involved as far as damage concerned, and one maybe not so bad. And the first one is... On the main drive pulley, you have what's called a mechanical torque sensor with these balls that ramp up on, on this shells, and, and they close off a feed hole with more torque, and that increases more pressure in the, in the pulley assembly. Um, this will, can get stripped out, and once the spline's stripped out, you have an absolutely no-move condition. A um, couple of things I could say about this, but we don't have time. Got a lot of things to cover. Um, so we're going to have to move on to the next possible reason for a, a sudden no-move condition, and that is we've seen pump drive and driven gears strip right out, and that can give you a sudden move. And now, of course, this would require uh, the pump drive gear and the driven gear. The, the driven gear is, is actually the pump itself, and it's mounted on the valve body. If you need to get that, you're, you're, you buy the whole assembly. The pump and valve body comes as a set. So you've got some big money right here involved here. Um, now, another no-move condition is certain diagnostic trouble codes that set will force a no-move condition. So here you might not have a major problem. You could, even, you could have maybe a bad TCM or there could be some other kind of a, a, a problem that isn't um, catastrophic and that's why it's a no-move condition. So you want to be clear on these three reasons for a sudden no-move condition in your diagnostic approach. So now, <clears throat> one, one tip that we can do here um, in, in, in maybe evaluating um, whether we have a lot of metal inside this unit or not is, like I said earlier, we have no pan, but it does have a good drain plug. So we could drain and take a look at the at the condition of the fluid and any of the metal contaminants. Another thing that we could do is we could actually pull the back cover off of the trans, pull the computer off the valve body, pull the valve body off the, uh, the transmission, and then take a look at this metal gate, um, this magnetic gate, excuse me, that is used to excite the transmission range sensor. Um, if there's a lot of metal in this unit, this magnetic gate will be loaded with a lot of metal. Now, this usually also can cause um, uh, transmission range sensor codes to set, and you could have engagement problems as a result of it. Now, the interesting thing about this scenario is the transmission range sensor is part of the computer. So now you're looking at uh, a possible catastrophic damage um, with the uh, transmission, maybe Maybe uh, the, the gears are stripped out. Um, there's some kind of problem where there's a lot of metal here, so it's going to be an expensive job. Uh, we're loaded up with metal. Um, is that computer bad or not? Well, one of the things that you could do here at this point is just clean the metal off of that magnetic gate, put everything back, clear the codes, and see if that transmission range sensor code comes back or not. It may indicate that you don't have a... Uh, a transmission range sensor problem. It was just because of too much metal on the magnet. The computer's okay, and maybe the amount of metal that's inside that transmission is not as bad as what it appears to be. So there's some ways that you can maybe make your approach at this particular point. You would want to decide whether you want to tear this thing out and really see what the damage is, or decide thinking that you're going to need another unit. Um, just throwing some numbers at this thing, um, uh, and and. And again, these are some basic numbers that you could you could find, but the idea to try to get a sense as to whether or not it's rebuildable or not. And I have to say, both the Honda and the O1J are are two of the most rebuildable units that I talk to a lot of guys on on the lines with. And so we don't really see a lot of these catastrophic damages uh, as much. But it's good to be aware of the type of problems that each one of these CVTs have. They really help you in your diagnostic approach and also to be able to evaluate whether it's worth rebuilding it or not. A new transmission I've seen run between four to $6,000. 
a brand new TCM I've seen between twelve to fifteen hundred dollars and you need to be aware that anything two thousand six and later, if you are not able to connect to Audi of North America network with some some uh, pass through devices uh, you're going to have to go to the dealer and spend three hundred and seventy five dollars to unlock the the o six and later TCMs uh, a master kit. Uh, could run in around 800 bucks, frictions and steels included, filters around 75, fluids around 128, and now you're looking at your labor rate about 16 hours to R&R and overhaul the unit. Um, so, again, by looking at this unit, you could fairly quickly determine if you've got a major problem or a rebuildable unit. Um, <clears throat> the last uh, CVT that we're going to look at that does not use a torque converter, it's not the last one for the evening, the last one that does not use a torque converter is the, the BMW Mini. Um, uh, this unit's not hard to work on. And, and, the, and again, the reason why this is um, not the friendliest unit is so many people have a hard time getting them to work after they're done rebuilding them. But anyway... Um, this CVT, once again, does not use a torque converter, so once again, you've got to keep in mind that it does have a, uh, a dual-mass flywheel uh, torsion damper type flywheel that can give you that chattering and clicking, metallic noises, and so forth. Um, now, just like the O1J, um, if it slips in forward and reverses okay, um, it could mean that we just have a forward clutch problem and the variator's okay uh, because, again, there's no start clutch here and there's no torque converter. So this has a forward and reverse clutch. So like the O1J, we do have to release the forward clutch and reapply the forward clutch. We have to release the reverse clutch, apply the reverse clutch. So if we're having just a problem in either forward or just reverse, we might just be looking at just um, that problem right there, uh, a problem with the forward clutch or a problem with the reverse clutch. Now, I, I will have to say that one of the solenoids, the one that's in the, uh, in the case, is a, is a clutch pressure control solenoid. If that clutch pressure control solenoid is faulty, um, it can give us a slip both forward and reverse as well. Um, and that could maybe mask this being a variator problem. But I'm going to cover that in just a second, how we could figure that out maybe pretty quickly. Um, but if you're just having a problem forward and reverse is okay, that would at least let us know that the variator is okay. Um, now, I will have to say that originally when, when these units started hitting the road, even if you help somebody, there was no parts to be had. And... Uh, Lately, there's been uh, many parts available. Um, just be prepared to price shop before you start tackling this job um, because I've seen prices vary and, and parts come and go. So um, um, just check into it. Um, we do have bearing problems like almost all CVTs, but some of these bearings are not available. Uh, and we have the same issue with uh, the JFO11 as we hit that one later on. In fact, that will be the last transmission for this evening. But the one thing is that we can, um, we do have a transmission that has, this transmission does have some pressure taps. It has a secondary pulley pressure, and it has the clutch pressure tap. So we can, if we do have a slip in all ranges, we can at least do a clutch pressure test and secondary pulley pressure test to see where this problem may be. And of course, as you can see, it has a pan, so we can actually drop the pan. We can do a real physical inspection pretty quickly. Here we can see that we've got a lot of, a lot of metal. Once you pull that valve body off, boy, you got a clear shot at the drive and driven pulley. So um, um, you can see if there's any damage there visibly, like you see here. Now, <clears throat> Obviously, when you see something like this, you know you've got a major job on your hands. Now, this particular transmission, once overhauled, there is some um, specific clutch and ratio daps that will need to be performed, and they're relatively easy to do. The bottom line here is that we, we make that same approach um, that we would with, with, like we did with the Honda, like we did with the O1J, kind of have an idea of how the system works, knowing that um, the forward clutch has got to come off and 
come on and a reverse clutch kind of come off and on and all that. We know we have a, a clutch control solenoid for this particular transmission. Uh, understanding these these unique aspects of the CVTs goes a long way in just an absolute road test before you even put it on a rack to decide what your next step is going to be in making this assessment. And with this um, uh, BMW Mini, um, I definitely recommend that you you find uh, about what the damage is and really start seeing what your prices are for price for parts because that can be a showstopper. Um, if you can get parts reasonably priced, uh, uh, it's a rebuildable unit. But like I said, after it's done, I've had a lot of people really fighting with getting it to work right afterwards. So anyway, the next um, um, thing I want to bring up about this CVT is uh, some self-inflicted injuries that you really want to pay attention to if you've not worked on this transmission. And this could save you uh, a big headache. Um, there's what's called pedo tubes. Some people call it pitot tubes. I call them pedo tubes. There's two of them, one on the back side of the pump and one in front of the pump on the case. And if you don't know they're there, when you disassemble the unit, you're going to break them. And, and then to try to get those pedo tubes is a nightmare. Um, here you can see the slinger is bolted on the back of the main pulley shaft, four bolts. But you rotate the slots so that you can see the hold down bolt for the pedo tube that's inside that slinger. And you want to take that bolt off. You'll see the bracket for the pedo tube. You want to move that out of the way. And then remove the four bolts and take the slinger off. And you won't damage that pedo tube that you can see there. Now, when you pull the pump out and you look inside, there's another pedo tube that you can see at the 12 o'clock position. That is held in with a uh, roll pin on the other side inside the case. You need to knock that roll pin out. You need to pull that pedo tube out so that you don't break it. If you're not aware of this, you're going to pull this thing apart, and you're going to break it, and you're going to find the pieces, and you're going to say, ah, I found the reason for the problem of this transmission. No, you just made another problem. And then if you don't put it back right, now you can't get the pump to go back on, and now if the pump doesn't sit right, you're going to have a no-move condition. That pedo tube that's in the case, uh, let me just go back to that again, uh, the one that you see there. If that's broken or not working right, you will not get an upshift out of first gear. Anyway, uh, getting now to the Ford CFT30. Uh, this is the first um, uh, CVT that we're going to look at that... Um, that uses a torque converter. And um, the computer for this transmission is like the O1J. It's, it, this particular computer is mounted on the valve body. Uh, and so just like the O1J, the wires obviously go into the case connector or CAN bus, power, grounds, uh, uh, shifter signals, and things like that. Um, this particular transmission, though, has no pressure taps. Um, so pressure testing is done by viewing PIDs in a scan tool, which means the accuracy of the PIDs rely on properly working pressure transducers, just like the O1J. However, I'm going to show you that there's a workaround. If you absolutely need to get a gauge on here, I'm going to show you how it can be done. Um, but you can uh, do a pan drop. Um, it does have a pan that can be pulled for visual inspection uh, of the condition of the fluid. The valve body can be also be re removed and give you a clear look at the condition of the pulley face, which I have a picture of that that I'll show you shortly. But like I said, this, this CVT does have a torque converter. And in fact, one common problem with this transmission is with the torque converter, and it has to do with the flimsy design of the clutch plate and it not being piloting uh, well, that where the O-ring on the tip of the turbine shaft rides, this area begins to get grooved out, and it compromises the O-ring to the place that the O-ring on the tip of the turbine shaft will actually come off. Um, now, the confusing aspect to this particular problem is that it, it, it never seems to set a converter clutch slip code. Instead, instead, it stores a turbine shaft speed sensor code. Um, when this problem occurs, it's usually described as an, as an engine RPM fluctuation during highway speeds with steady throttle or 
I've even heard it where it occurs during a, an engine RPM fluctuation during a slight tip in into the throttle. Um, the repair for this particular problem um, usually is just changing the torque converter and putting a new O-ring on the end of the input shaft. But changing the torque converter, you know, that's maybe be about $350, $400, somewhere in there, um, unless the person rebuilding that converter modifies that converter, you've really not changed anything. That You've still got that flimsy clutch plate in there that I believe because it's not piloted, it's just kind of floating in there. I think that's what really takes out that O-ring. Now, you may think that since this transmission does use a torque converter, there is less opportunity for forward or reverse clutch to fail. And, and, and you, you'd be right in that assumption. However, um, <clears throat> Uh, the forward clutch circuit for this transmission has many places where this can fail, and we can indeed see forward clutch failure. And in fact, what I'm going to show you, not only can it give you forward clutch failure, and again, you know, if the forward, if we, if we got a problem with just going forward and reverse is okay, well, that lets us know that reverse is good uh, and, uh, and the variator is good. But now if we're slipping both forward and reverse, you know, sort of like the uh, BMW Mini Cooper, is it a clutch pressure problem or is it a variator problem? Well, it's almost the same thing here with the Ford. Um, there could be clutch pressure issues um, that will mask itself as being variator problems. Um, so I'm going to walk you through this and show you the unique way in which pressure is supplied to the forward and reverse clutch and the various problems that you can have with this. Now. Here is what the uh, transmission looks like with the valve body removed. And as you can see, we have a clear shot of the, um, of the pulley. And in this particular case, what we call the chain. That's not a push belt. That is a chain, and it's similar to the one that's used in the O1J in, in, its, in its design. But anyway, one of the things that you'll see here is that there's lots of plumbing going on. There's lots of these little tubes with O-rings on them between the valve body and the case. And those O-rings are absolutely critical. We can have a variety of different kinds of problems with the variators and, and pump and, and even the supply of pressure for the forward and reverse clutch if these O-rings are compromised. Now, we're going to specifically look at um, this, um, the way this uh, uh, forward clutch is fed um, and, and, and reverse. And one of the things we have to keep in mind is there is no manual valve inside this valve body. The manual valve is in a separate transmission range sensor assembly housing. Now, what you see here in the bottom right-hand corner is where line pressure is fed to this manual valve in that range sensor assembly. And there's a closer look at it now with the O-ring sealing tube removed, and now the feed pipe that goes to this assembly is in view. Now, this assembly is located inside the transmission right up in here by the case. And where that pressure comes in from the valve body is underneath this assembly. So we're going to take this assembly off and look at the bottom of it. When we look at the bottom of this, the left-hand side is where this feed pipe goes in, supplying pressure to that manual valve. Manual valve is in the middle port, and obviously when it's in drive, it will route that line pressure to the right-hand port, which will then go on to feed forward clutch. Now, this is looking at the bottom of it. Now we're going to look inside the transmission. There is the feed pipes. The one on the left is your supply, your pressure supply, going into that assembly. The one on the right-hand side is what goes on to feed forward clutch. Now, right there, you can see that there's O-rings. If we have... Uh, compromised O-rings either down by the valve body or right here supplying that manual valve assembly, it will, it will affect both forward and reverse clutch supply, and you'll slip both in forward and reverse, and it'll seem like you have a variator problem. Whereas uh, if it's just the, the forward clutch or just the reverse clutch, it's easy enough to decide. But here on the right-hand side is the pipe that goes on to feed your forward clutch. Now, it continues to this back or end cover on the transmission. Now, with this cover removed, looking at the back of the transmission, on the upper right-hand corner, 
that is your feed supply for your forward clutch. The bottom left is your, your primary pulley supply. So everything's right back there. Now if we look at that back cover, we can see again on the right-hand side, forward clutch pressure enters the back cover and it comes all the way up the tube that you see in the center. And that's where it begins to feed your forward clutch. So many places we could be losing forward clutch. Now if you look at the tip of that tube, you can see that there's two seals. The upper seal obviously to contain forward clutch. The lower seal is to prevent primary pulley pressure from getting into the forward clutch circuit. So if we got failure here, we got a mess. And, and, and some of these problems are due to this end cover. So it's good to be aware of how critical this end cover is. Now, we're not done yet with the forward clutch circuit. We now have to go between these two O-rings before we finally get into the forward clutch drum. So there's ample places for us to have forward clutch issues. Um, as far as reverse clutch, this is the tube off of that assembly that feeds the reverse clutch. Now, the, uh, the self-inflicted injury that we can have here is um, we could knock that out of position when we're trying to get the case halves together, or we could forget to even put it in, and now we're going to have reverse clutch problems. So you, you'll want to be aware of how careful you need to be when you put this with these two case halves together. Now, as I said earlier, here is a workaround. If you absolutely need to find a way to hook up pressure gauges, you can actually work on the back of this transmission. You can get into primary pressure, you can get into secondary pressure, you can get into forward clutch pressure, and you can get into reverse clutch pressure. So there is ways if you're, if you're brave and you want to do some modification, um, you, can, you can make those uh, tests. Now, continuing on with common problems that can happen with this CVT, and, and again, uh, very important to know these things so you can evaluate whether it's a rebuildable unit or not. One of the common problems that we have is this um, needle bearing that, that goes between the turbine shaft and the drive pulley assembly. Now, many times, <clears throat> this needle bearing goes bad, and not only does it goes bad and gets pitted, um, it can also ruin the turbine shaft assembly, which is your planetary, your input shaft and planetary. Now, the the little needle bearing is like only seven to ten dollars, but this this input shaft assembly is running around five to six hundred dollars with a hundred dollar core charge if you don't give them the, the core because I guess they're taking them and re-sleeving them or something. But anyway, um, uh, if you have this failure, um, you're definitely going to be looking at, at um, some money here. Um, the good news though, in one sense, is so far we haven't seen that pitted needle bearing affect the input pulley assembly, and so in that way there might be good news. Now there was a time where this bearing was not available at all, and it seems that recently this bearing has become available once again, but you know, you should check with your local parts supplier before jumping into this repair. Now another uh, bearing noise area that this transmission is commonly known for is with the transfer gear. Um, and, and as well as the differential assembly. Now this transfer gear assembly can be accessed without taking the transmission apart. You can pull it out, as you can see here. Now the problem is, since the differential assembly is prone to making noise, it's really difficult to know, do you have a transfer gear bearing noise or a differential bearing noise? Um, so what some shops have done is they keep a good transfer gear bearing assembly in stock. And if they think that they've got a transfer bearing or differential bearing noise, they'll just simply pull this transfer out, put their new one in. If their noise goes away, they know they got the job done and now they can sell that transfer gear bearing assembly and, be, and put the new one back in stock and be on their way. But if they put this new one in, uh, and the bearing, and they're still bearing noises, now we know that there might be more extensive damage inside this transmission. Um, and, uh, and that may require considering uh, whether you can reman or rebuild, and, and you're going to have to do some price checking there. Um, 
One other note here is that um, these, this is a, CV, uh, a ZF transmission, and so these are ZF solenoids, which we know we never have a problem with these solenoids. Of course not. No, these solenoids are, have, are known to have issues. And in fact, these solenoids that you see right here, these blue and yellow ones, are the exact same solenoids that are in the ZF6 beats. And, um, and, and in fact, you can buy these solenoids separately in around 100 bucks each. Um, if you can get them, because right now uh, uh, they're running out because they're such a problem that I even know some sources that say, hey, listen, I got two blues left. That's all I got. I don't know where the rest is coming from. So uh, be aware. So if you do have some ZF sitting on a shelf and you need to have some solenoid, you can grab them from there. Now, <clears throat> another self-inflicted injury here is if you do not have to pull the pump off of this uh, CVT, don't do it unless you have the special tools required to put it back on. It's a bear if you don't have the right tools. Okay, uh, coming up now is um, uh, the uh, GM's uh, VT2025. Um, <clears throat> this particular um, transmission um, doesn't have a pan that can be dropped to do an, a visual, uh, but it does have uh, pressures that can be checked. Um, uh, these pressures can be as high as 800 to 1,000 pounds. Remember, a transducer is really important here. Um, this transmission has been discontinued for quite a number of years now, so parts can be challenging to find at times. So um, you might want to keep that in mind. Now, the most common problem that we see with this is forward clutch failure, even though it does have a torque converter. Um, and, and the reason why we have a common problem with this is the between the turbine shaft and the drive pulley assembly, there is a seal pressed in on the inside of that turbine shaft, and that seal can go bad and uh, can give you forward clutch failures. And so it can be a real simple job, and there's been quite a number of these units being rebuilt as well. Um, we get a paper and rubber kit and uh, gaskets and clutches and filter to do a basic rebuild. You can get through this thing. But when it comes to hard parts, um, solenoids, uh, you, you might need to call around to see what you can find and how much it's going to cost because that could really determine whether you can really do a job with this or not. Now, some self-inflicted injuries that you might want to avoid um, <clears throat> is um, these um, uh, mounting bolts. Um, you could actually put the wrong mounting bolts in there and you can um, crack the case, and that could give you some problems here. Um, a uh, had a little problem here with my PowerPoint. I don't know what happened there, a little flicker. But anyway, moving on, another um, self-inflicted injury that we can have is um, reassembling the drive pulley assembly. Um, the drive pulley assembly it can be disassembled. It's a driven pulley, you can. I mean, it's crimped together, and by the time you're done taking that apart, it's destroyed. But the drive pulley you can take apart, and the drive pulley... Underneath it, the, the pulley face that moves, there are these two check balls per slot. There's three slots, so we've got a total of six check balls in these long slots. And they help guide the, um, the, the drive pulley sheath face as it moves in and out as it's, as it's ratioing the belt. And um, the thing is, is that you can accidentally put these two balls on these short slots. And if you put them in the short slots, they fall into the hydraulic circuit. Once they do that, these balls bounce around and they really beat up the piston that's for that um, dry pulley. And, uh, and now you've got a busted up piston, you've got busted up seals, you've definitely got a dry pulley issue. So you want to be careful there that you don't make that mistake because these kind of parts are hard to get individually. One last um, uh, self-inflicted injury that happens with this CVT uh, is not properly indexing the ratio control valve. Um, at, at the top end of this ratio control valve is a lever that needs to fit inside the pintle on the um, stepper motor. And uh, you can see that pintle at the base of the stepper motor where that lever is located. Um, you want to make sure it's inside there. And you, as you can see, there's the uh, ratio control valve and the one end of the lever inside the pintle. The other lever going down into the transmission needs to be indexed right into that drive pulley follower pocket. 
And if you miss it, you're not going to have any ratio changes. It's a, actually, it's like a pivot point, and it helps to uh, let, the, uh, uh, let the stepper motor properly ratio that ratio control valve. So those are some, some self-inflicted injuries that you could avoid. Um, last but not least is the JF011 uh, CVT. Uh, real nice unit to work on. Parts are becoming available. Um, it's, got, it's, it's got a torque converter. It's got all the pressure taps that you need. Um, you can drop the pan. You can pull the valve body. You can do all kinds of inspection. Again, this just has a forward and a reverse clutch. It's, it's all pretty much straightforward like everything else that we've been talking um, with CVTs. Um, one of the problems what we do have with this one is, unfortunately, these bearings that are on the pulleys, um, uh, they go bad and they don't sell them separately. They're hard to uh, find to match up because they got a plastic seal around the ball bearings, um, which obviously isn't doing very good because they, they go bad. Anyway, um, uh, just like any of the other transmissions that we're dealing with today, you know, you can't get these solenoids separately. You've got to buy the whole valve body. If you start swapping out valve bodies, you've got to make sure that you keep the ROM with the valve body because all that – uh, with the with the with the vehicle, excuse me, because all the necessary information for that vehicle um, to ratio this CBT is in that ROM. So you want to make sure that if you're swapping valve bodies, that you don't get those ROMs mixed up. That can give you a whole new headache for yourself. And and be aware that when doing um, uh, um, checks on the solenoids, that this particular CBT is used in Dodge, Jeep. Nissan and Mitsubishi, and uh, Nissan and Mitsubishi, all their solenoids are grounded inside the valve body. However, with Dodge and Jeep, three of the solenoids are spliced together, the grounds are spliced together, and they go through the pass-through connector to external grounds. So there are some differences there that can catch you off guard if you're not aware of them. And uh, another self-inflicted injury to watch out for this CVT is that the secondary pulley assembly, uh, I mean secondary speed sensor, uh, can have one shim, two shims under them, or no shims. Be sure that uh, you don't lose them when installing this uh, sensor. So uh, I went as fast as I could to get through this time. Um, any questions that I cannot answer, uh, if you provide contact information, I'll do my best to get an answer to you in a timely manner. But from Transstar, Transtech, MotorAge, Powertrain Pro, and the ATSG Tech team, I want to thank you for your participation this evening. Well, Wayne, that sure was a lot of information. We certainly appreciate the time and effort you took to, to take to that. Before we get to the few questions that we can answer while we still have some time, let me just tell everyone that, hey, if you want to stay with Powertrain Pro and what MotorAge is doing, look at any of the social media networks. Pick your favorite, Facebook, Google+, Twitter. LinkedIn, we're, we're everywhere that you can look for that, uh, just, just search Motor Age Magazine and you'll find us there. Uh, we have a few questions we'll have time to get to before we have to wrap it up. Um, Wayne, let's start with this first question. On the BMW Mini Cooper Trans, what could cause an RPM climb at freeway speed? So the vehicle seems to drive fine for a short time at 70 miles an hour, then at the same speed the RPM will climb to almost 6,000. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure if I know the actual reason for that, but my, my thinking would be that, um, that if it's seeing a slip, it might be trying to compensate for that slip. Is there, is there any other, is there any codes that are related to that, that issue? I'm not quite sure I know why that is happening. Well, the, temp the uh, technician says that if you put it into sport mode, the problem is drastically less. It still happens. Maybe could that be a possible uh, programming issue? Well, that's that's exactly what um, what makes me think, especially if it can change it based on switching up shift programming. Um, that could just be something related to that. Uh, but you know, there's 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 uh, ways to to do ratio uh, adapts and clutch adapts. It might require just resetting the adapts to see what would happen. That's where I would go with that. Sounds like a good place to start. Uh, how, here's another one. Here's an interesting one. How do the valve bodies of CVTs differ from planetary valve bodies? From what kind of valve bodies? 
Uh, the, from planetary valve bodies is the technician's question. I'm not sure I know what a planetary valve body is. Perhaps he's referring to a, a, a conventional automatics valve oh, body. Okay, well, well uh, the valve bodies are, are different in the sense of how the controls are in, in changing the pressure and either the drive or driven pulley assembly to ratio the belt. Um, we have higher pressures that are being run. Um, it's not like we're shifting through gears on a conventional uh, transmission where we're going one to two to three. We're constantly ratioing the uh, the, the variator, and so we're, we're, we don't have valves that are being turned on and off in that sense where we're shifting through the gears. So in that way, it's different, and we're running much higher pressure too. Sure, that takes care of the question. Uh, the second question the tech had. Um, here's another one for you. Is the labor time adequate for the proper repair of a CVT, or is the labor time cut down to the point that it would be hard to build in the stated time frame? <laughs> that's a, well, that's a good question. Um, uh, I, I, I would have to say that when you're doing this for the first time, the labor time is definitely not sufficient. Um, by doing them enough times where you get to know that transmission, um, you can do that within labor time and, and make money. Yeah, isn't that kind of true any, with any kind of uh, first time at a flat rate you know, basis? If it's the first time you did the job, you know, there's going to be a learning curve with that, that first operation, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, see, here's another good question for you. Maybe you might help this tech with a problem with a shutter associated with the Honda CVT. Okay, that that could be with the start clutch, and um, um, and that is the uh, one of the common problems that we do get with the Honda CVT is shutter on uh, and due to the start clutch. And uh, again, we don't want to be um, uh, misled if there may be a uh, uh, a damper plate problem. Um, sometimes we can get shutters out of the damper plate, but typically it's a start clutch issue. And uh, uh, and, and you could do a start clutch pressure test on that and see if there's a, a leak there. Uh, inspect the uh, condition of the fluid. It, the pan can be dropped, um, but the start clutch is, is definitely uh, uh, a common problem for that complaint. Yeah, and, and there are several other good questions. Of course, as Wayne pointed out, we will do our, our best to follow up with those uh, here right after the conclusion of the webinar over the next day or two. Once again, many thanks to our sponsors, TransTech and TransStar, and of course, ATSG's Wayne Colonna. It's, been a, uh, it's just been a great partnership between MotorAge and ATSG in the development of Powertrain Pro. I hope that you will log on to MotorAge.com and take advantage of all the resources that, uh, that Wayne and his team have brought to bear. Wayne, thanks again so much for your, for your time and your effort. Great presentation, and thanks to everyone who came to participate. Thank you.